Okay, good afternoon. Howdy. Gonna get ready to get started with the lecture for today. Um, before we get started, do you have any questions based on the material we cover on Monday? So, yes. So, so we started discussing this uh, material on output analysis. And what I'm going to do is just going to give you a brief summary of what we discussed on Monday. So first thing we did was to discuss what output analysis is and the purpose of output analysis. Then we established that there are two types of simulations. Based, you can classify simulations in two different types based on the type of analysis that you're going to perform on their outputs. And those two types are terminating and non-terminating simulations. Also, we went through these examples. That's basically to help you understand what's the difference between a terminating and non-terminating simulation. The next thing we did was to discuss uh, several measures of performance and also how to compute estimates, point estimators for those performance measures. And we talked a little bit about what is an unbiased and unbiased estimator. And the last thing we did was to start talking about confidence intervals. And specifically, uh, you want to use confidence interval to measure the, the error for those point estimates or those uh, measures of performance from your simulation. And in essence, we, we are using confidence interval because we know that for, we want to know for certain how far is this estimator from the real value. So we want to create these bounds that uh, basically gives you the probability of having the real value or the theoretical value within these bounds. So um, the first thing we're going to do today is to work with this example. Um, this is a very simple example. And then what we have here is, is, let's say these are cycle times. So we have 10 point estimates. These are coming from different replications. So you're getting a cycle time for each replication. And we want to compute the confidence interval for this data. So the first thing you do, let me uh, go back and write this. So for a com confidence interval, you need the sample mean plus minus the T statistics for alpha hat, where alpha is your confidence, and R minus 1, where R is the number of replications that you're looking at times the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of replications. Okay, so the first thing we have to compute is the sample mean. So we only have 10 numbers. So this sample mean, here we are using x bar, would be equal to 93 plus 113 until you get to 805 divided by the number of observations. In this case, the number of data points we have are 10. So the sample mean will be equal to 804.6. Next value we need is the standard deviation. So first, we have to compute the sample variance. So in order to get the sample variance, we know that x squared will be equal to summation from i equals 1 to n of the data point square minus n times x bar square divided by n minus 1, n minus 1 because we have one degree of freedom. We are using the sample average in our sample variance. And this will be equal to 
6.58.6 square, which means that our standard deviation is 6.58.6. So we have our sample average, our sample standard deviation. So x bar. So we need to compute at s over the square root of r. And this is 2.08. And the value for the t distribution for alpha half r minus 1 equals 2.26. So now we can get our confidence interval using these numbers. So the way we're going to express the confidence interval in this class is the following. You're going to put the sample mean plus minus the value of the half width, which in this case is 2.26 times <coughs> 2.08. So this means that this is 104.6 plus minus, I don't have that number. Uh, yes. The Y bar, this one? Yeah. This, yes, this could be X bar, oh, yeah. And this equals 5.44. So at the end, your interval is 99.9. And that's the confidence interval. And we are using a 95% confidence interval. 99.9. .9. Yes. Okay, simple, right? Just I, I'm pretty sure that this is not the first time you, you're seeing this. So this is a review. Um, in terms of having a in pictorical interpretation of a confidence interval, so what we're trying to do is the following. You know that theta is the true value or the theoretical value for the performance measure that we are trying to estimate using simulations. So this is our true, but unknown parameter, right? If you look for a 90% confidence interval, you basically are doing this. So let's say this is the real value for theta. If you compute the confidence interval for each one of the replications, a 90% confidence interval, basically what it's doing is, or it's telling you that for those 10 replications, this is theta, One, two, three, six, seven, eight. Ninety percent, if you're looking at, let me write that down. So for a ninety percent confidence interval,
So our 90% confidence interval, what it's going to do is it's going to tell us that 90% of the time for our 10 replications, our interval is going to contain, or the intervals those ten, from those 10 intervals, at least nine of them are going to contain the true value or the theoretical value for the performance measure. So in this case, we are looking at a 90% confidence interval. You have 10 intervals. So the confidence interval is going to make sure that at least nine of those 10 intervals contains the true value or the theoretical value of theta. So in this case, we have nine of the confidence interval containing that value, and one of them does not contain that true value. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do with the confidence interval. So the 90% of these intervals will contain theta and 10% will not contain theta. Issue. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so you say you have 10 replications, right? And for each replication, you compute the mean for a cycle time. Yeah. So you, 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 see, you see the mean of those means, you can get the, the mean of across replications. And using that mean, so. Yeah, so you have for each, let's say this is R1, R2, and so on until R10. Then for each replication, you know that you will get a X bar, yeah. right? And you use that X bar to compute the confidence interval, those bounds. Those bounds are going to be defined in such a way that you will create bounds for this replication, this replication, and that's where these bounds come from. So the confidence interval for a 90% basically is going to be sure that or the test is going to tell you that 90% of the time for these replications, yeah. those bounds are going to contain the true value of the performance measure. So at least 9 out of the 10? Yes. Okay. Yes, correct. OK. Any other question? Um, well, we need to know how to do the pictorial interpretation on the test. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you to draw something, but I, I'll probably ask you to interpret what is a confidence interval and how can you use, use it, or what does a confidence interval do. Okay. okay, so interpretation of the confidence interval. So an interval with random data dependent endpoints that's supposed to have stated probability of containing or covering the expected value. And the target expected value is a fixed unknown number And what the expected value does is it's going to it's going to average of the infinite number of replications. So in order to get the real number from your system, you know that you're going to have to run this simulation for infinite time. And you're going to have to contain all the information possible from the system. Okay, So again, the interval. So I don't want you to get confused. So most of the time when I ask what is a confidence interval, again, This is what I just explained. So 90% of the time, this <laughs> interval is going to contain the true value. It's not an interval 
that contains, say, 90% of the data. Okay? It's not an interval that contains 90% of the data. It's, it's an interval that will assure that you at, contains the true value of that expected performance measure 90% of the time. Okay? So, that being said, now we can transition to output analysis for terminating simulations. So again, we have two types of simulation, terminating and non-terminating. I'm going to start by discussing how to analyze the output of a terminating simulation. So, we know that a terminating simulation runs over a simulated time. Interval, which goes from zero to T E, and T E is the time of the last event. A common goal is to estimate the value of those performance measures. So to estimate this, we look at the expected, let's say of the average, one over N, summation from i equals 1 up to n of y i. And this is for discrete output. So those are mainly the type of performance that we are looking at when we have a set of replications. We look at the average. Um, in general, we use independent replications. So in the prep, independent replications are used. And we know that for each replication, we need to use a different seed for the random number generators. Sir, you have a question? Oh, we're just, we're just studying. Okay. So each run use a different random number string. And has independently chosen initial conditions. So for terminating red dust. Output analysis, in general, we use independent replications. Uh, each runs using a different random number stream. Remember, we discussed how to generate random numbers. Every replication should use a different seed for those random numbers. And we have independently chosen initial conditions. That means that we, we're going to have a certain number of resources in our simulation and certain numbers of um, Certain numbers of resources and certain number of, uh, let's say, cashiers or server, servers, machine, and so on. Okay? So, statistical background is very important. And the first thing that we need to know is we need to dis distinguish between across replications and within replication data. So, Within, rep, uh, within replication data, from across 
replication data. So you know that on each replication, you're going to be collecting information from all the entities. So if you're collecting the cycle time for a particular replication, you know that you're going to get the cycle time for each entity that runs that specific uh, replication. Now, that's what we call within replication information. Now, at the end of the simulation, remember we get a output report. That information is computing using the information that comes across the replications and uses the output of each replication performance measure. So for example, let's look at simulation of a manufacturing system. We look at two performance measures of the system, the cycle time for the parts and the working process. And let yij be the cycle time for the j part produced in the it replication. The across replication data are formed by summarizing within replication data. So the within replication data is basically the information for each entity for the first replication. So this is the second entity, first replication, first replication, third entity, and so on. So you'll get n numbers or error n data points for these same replication, and at the end, you get the average, the variance, and the half width for that particular replication. And same thing happened with the second replication. So for the second replication, first entity, second entity, third entity, and so on. So you get the average for that second replication, the standard deviation, and the half width. And at the end, so again, you're using the within replication data to get the across replication data. But using the across replication data, you also get the performance. And that is what is produced by the output summary in ARENA, the output summary report gives you the Y bar that comes from this information. So it's the average of the average, and same for the standard deviation, the variance, and the half width. Yes, sir? The Y bar is the same as the Y double bar? This last one, the one that here, uh -huh. that's basically the average. So you have an average for this information. This is the average. Then this one is the average of this average. Okay. Yes, sir. Why does it do it like that? So <laughs> for for e simulation. So you have to think about what you're doing in a simulation experiment. You're trying to you're trying to improve a system, for example. Right? And you're wanna you wanna test a different configuration for this system. If you run only one experiment using one random seed, you will have only one uh, interarrival process following the interarrival times based on the, in the distribution that you are uh, using for your simulation model. So at the end of that replication, you have a result, which is this one. But is that enough to make a conclusion? You're only testing your simulation on the one scenario. So you're saying that that's what's going to happen every time. Is that enough to make a final recommendation? No, because you know that your system will, ha will be working on their uncertainty. So that can change the way that the system performs. So that's why you need to perform multiple experiments. And that's what we call replications. Each replication is a different experiment. Your is so for the first experiment, you use a uh, set of arrivals. For your second experiment, you use a different set of arrivals. For your third experiment, you use a different set of arrivals. And then you are able to compute several the same performance measure, but under different conditions. Yes? So, like you're producing a different set of like, <coughs> right? But 
Yes. You're still simulating the same thing. You're simulating the same system? Yeah, same system. So never under different conditions. And that's the type, of, the type of experiment that we want to do. Because we want to test our system under different conditions. For example, if you look at McDonald's, yeah. you know that you're going to receive customers every day. Yeah. But the same, you don't receive the same amount of customers every day. So, so at the end, you want to know what is the best configuration for my system based on the different scenarios that might happen in this particular system. Because if you, this is a different experiment than this one. So you, don't, you cannot take the average of all the, all the observations because they are different experiments. So you have a performance for this set of conditions. You have a performance for this set of conditions. And at the end, you want to know overall. overall what is the performance of the system. No, it's not. It's because they're independent experiments. So this performance is going to be based only on that experiment. Uh, no, I understand. Yeah. I guess we'll talk about it later. And remember, yeah, maybe we can talk later. Yeah. But remember, this output summary, we are, we are defining a confidence interval for that output summary. And we can do that because we are using the average of the average. And we are assuming that when you know when you have the average of the average, the normal distribution is going to follow based on the central limit theorem. Yeah. And that's why you can define a confidence interval based on that theorem. OK? Any other question? OK. So this is essentially what we are trying to do. So here is some of the performance that you can compute. This is basically the formulas that you can use to compute the performance across replications and within replications. <coughs> wow. And overall, we want to get the sample average. Y bar and the interval replication sample average and these both are always on bias estimators of the expected daily average cycle time and daily average width. Across replication data are independent. Because we are using different random numbers. Or seats for our random number generators and identically distributed. Because they are coming from the same model. But within replication data does not contain these properties, does not have these properties. OK. So, Sometimes we want to, yes, sir. Oh, here. Yes. So sometimes you want to define a confidence interval with a specified precision. And this is very important because you can always define a confidence interval, but if your confidence interval gives you a confidence of 40%, that's basically not telling you a, anything. It's not a good estimate for your performance. So sometimes we want to get 
the specific performance for our confidence interval. And the way we do that is by incrementing the number of replications or observations from our system. So now what I'm going to explain to you is how to use uh, statistics to basically define how many replications that you will, you will need to define a specific performance for your confidence interval in simulation. So let's start by saying that the half length H, this is the half width of your confidence interval of a 100% times 1 minus alpha confidence interval for a mean theta based on the T distribution is given by this. So H, you know, is going to be equal to T alpha over 2, R minus 1, times S over the square root of r. And we know that r is the number of replications. Suppose that an error criterion epsilon is specified with the probability of 1 minus alpha. So a sufficiently large sample size should satisfy the following two things. When the sample size uh, r is fixed, then there's no guarantee can be given for the resulting error. But if the sample size can be increased, an error criterion can be specified. So again, the only way that you can satisfy that condition of your confidence interval be, will be within this error or specify error is by increasing the number of replications that you're going to use in your simulation. So if your sample size, let's say the number of replications is fixed, then there's no guarantee that you can satisfy that condition. But if you can increase the number of replications for your simulation, then an error criterion can be specified. So assume that the initial sample size are zero, that's the number of replications that you're going to use, um, has been observed. Then you obtain an initial estimate for your variance of the population. Then you choose a sample size r such that this condition and this, con the other, this other condition based on the half width r minus 1 times this is less than that error that you specify. In arena, does it give you half width? Yes. Half width? Yes. <coughs> and that's something that we're going to start doing from Monday. So, so far we have only reported the sample mean or the mean for our statistics. From Monday on, I'm going to be asking different things. I'm going to ask you to report the confidence interval. And also, based on our lectures, you will have to answer some questions. So if that information is enough, would you have to increase the number of replications, and so on. Okay, So that's why this lecture is, is important. You're going to be using this also in the lab. Um, so let's say that r is the small inter integer satisfying r, um, r greater or equal to the number of your initial number of replications, and also satisfying this, r being greater or equal to t r minus one s zero divided by epsilon. So let me write this here. It's not clear enough. So r needs to be greater or equal to 
this half width that is defined by t alpha divided by 2 r minus 1 times the standard deviation of your initial experiments divided by epsilon square. Since we know that the t statistic of alpha over 2 r minus 1 is greater or equal to the, st the, standard, normal, the, the uh, standard normal statistics c uh, alpha over 2, initial estimate of r can be given by using the normal distribution. So r should be greater or equal to c alpha 2 s0 divided by epsilon, where z alpha over 2 is the standard normal distribution. Yes, sir. Difference between the T statistic and the normal statistic. So, it the normal distribution, you know, that is coming by fixing the the mean to zero and also the standard deviation to one. So that's when you transform your information from the normal to a standard normal distribution, right? Um, for the T statistic. You are also using the normal distribution, but this time you are using parameters that are estimates. So it is based on the uh, central limit theorem that basically says that normal, the average of the average will follow a normal distribution, but these parameters are coming from estimates. So both of them are based on the normal, the normal has a fixed parameters. The T distribution has estimates in the parameters. So do you have degrees of freedom in both? So uh, um, I guess I don't understand why would that tells us for sure that the T statistic is always going to be greater than or equal to the Z statistic. Yeah, because the, the values that you're getting from the estimates are wider. So that's basically an upper bound from the real normal values, okay. Okay. okay? So when you compute this, you're basically trying to find an initial or a lower bound of the number of replications that you're going to need. But then you have to test or check if those, that number of, of replications are going to be enough. And that's where these come into place. And I'm going to show you this with an example. So at the end, what you're going to see is you're going to come up with a number that is going to tell you how many, no, how many additional replications you will need in order to satisfy the condition for having a confidence interval within this specified error. Okay? So you basically will compute the number of replications or additional replications that you're going to need for your uh, simulation. So let's look at the example, and I think the example will make things more clear. So let's say we have a call center, um, and we are uh, estimating the agent's utilization. We call that P over the first two hours of the workday. So we have an initial sample size. We only have four observations. And that, those observations are telling us that for the first day, the utilization was 80%. For the second day, the utilization was 88%. Third day, 71%. And the fourth day, 84%. We want to estimate the aging utilization to within this predetermined error, which is 0.04, plus or minus 0.04, with probability of 95%. Okay? So, let me just, so our epsilon 
or the specified error is 0 0.4. So this is our error criterion. We have, we can compute the average for our uh, performance measure, in this case, the agent utilization. So I'm going to call this P bar. And if you look at the average of these numbers, this is equal to 0 0.81. And if you compute the variance, this is going to be equal to 0 0.072 square. Now, we can get the half width also using that information. So we have T 0 0.025. We have four replications, so it's R minus 1. This is 3 times S divided by the square root of 4. And this is equal to 0 0.114. So the half width for our confidence interval is 0.11. So if you put your, say, p bar, If you compute the confidence interval, you know that this will be point 0 0.80 plus minus, right? That will be your confidence interval based on the information we compute. But that means that your confidence interval is plus 0.11 minus 0.11. And the error that we are looking at, or the length of the interval that we want, is 0.04. So that means that our current interval is too large. And we need to find a way to reduce the size of that half width to satisfy that condition. So it has to be less than or equal to 0.04. So we, got, we want to have a confidence interval that is small enough such that the half width is within this constraint, 0.04. So in order to do that, we need to increase the number of replications. to reduce the size of the confidence interval. So this is CI, confidence interval. OK, so it's clear what we're trying to do. We haven't specified ever or condition for our half width. We want our mean to be within this 0.04. But the current interval for our confidence interval is too large. So the only way that you can reduce the size of the confidence interval is by increasing the number of replications that you're using. So you want to collect more information. The more information you have, the better estimate you're going to have. And that will help you to reduce the size of your confidence interval. But the question now is, how many replications we need to add to our experiment? So you can easily say, OK, so I'm going to run 10 more replications, 20 more replications, 100 more replications, and that should, should do it. But what happened is, when you have to run a simulation, sometimes a, maybe not with the example we have seen in class, but if you run a large enough simulation, a replication can last 24 hours, 48 hours, depending on how many entities you need to manage. So sometimes it's not that easy to say, I'm going to run 100 more replications. So you need to know at least 
how many replicates would you need in order to satisfy that condition? So what you do is the next. Uh, so remember from here, you want to find out an initial estimate that will tell you how many replications will be enough. And you're going to find that initial estimate using this condition. So we're going to use the standard normal distribution. So let's say R has to be greater or equal to C times the standard deviation divided by the error square. And we are looking at the 95%. So this is 1.96 times square times our initial standard deviation is 0 0.005518 divided by the error, which is 0 0.04 square. So this equals 12.44. Okay. So the number of replications that you're going to need has to be at least 12. Well, 12.44. So that means that your number of replications will start from 13 and up. So yeah, that's your bound. So you know that at least you're going to need 13. But you don't know how many yet. And that's what we're going to find out next. So you know that you started your experiment with only four replications. This analysis is telling you that in order to satisfy that error or half width, you're going to need at least 13 replications. But we have to do an additional test to be sure that our error is going to be satisfied. So this is the last step. Yes. This is should be should be point zero seven two. It's a good question. You have two squares, yeah. Let me check. Yes, this one, this is the standard deviation. This is the variance. Okay, so this is not square. And now if you take the square root, then you'll get the standard deviation. No, because see that, that whole term is square at the top left. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, this is right. Yeah. Yeah, this is right. So this is right. If you, this is the square of this value. So if you square 0 0.072, this is the number you get, which is the variance. So here, what you're trying to do is you're looking at the square of each term. So C alpha over 2 is 1.96 square. So this is the same as saying you have 0 0.072 square. Same thing. Okay. So now you know that the number least is, let me just wrap up with this exercise. So this is giving you that lower bound. Now you need to find out what is the number of replications that you're going to need. And for that, you're going to use the expression for the t. Divided by epsilon. And what we're going to do is we're going to create this table. We know 
the R's that we're going to test. So we're going to start with 13, 14, and 15. And we're going <laughs> to check for the condition, if we are able to satisfy that condition with these T values. So if you compute the T, if you compute the expression, for R equals 13, you will get 15.39. If you compute for 14, this is 15.10. And for 15, this is 14.84. So which one of these three values is the one that satisfied that condition? R being greater or equal to this. We have R here. We have T here. So when you get to 15, you know 13 does not satisfy this. 13 is less than this. But when you get to 15, you see that you are able to satisfy this condition. So that means that the number of replications that you need for, the, for this experiment is 15. So R should be equal to 15. And because this is the smallest integer satisfying the, the inequality. And that means we are not done yet. So this, is, this means that R minus R0, you will need. 15 minus 4, 11 additional replications. OK? So 15 is not the additional number of replications you will need. You already have 4, so you have to look at the difference. And that means that you have to run your simulation 11 times in order to satisfy that error. OK? So we're going to stop here, um, probably sign you some homework based on this material. So if you have questions, you can talk to me now. I'm going to be in my office this afternoon and tomorrow. So or you can email me if you have any questions, OK? The homework will be for Monday? The homework, if, it is, if I assign it today, you, I always give you a week. So it will be for Wednesday. Yeah.